Diolch am y mynd o ni yng Nghanadledd Cenedlaethol Seren, dwi'n fel ag unrhyw gwyth, ewch yn bellach. Thank you for joining us in the Seren National Conference 2018, Above and Beyond, Dyma Session. This is Session, a Dyniaethau Humanities. Um, I'm Dr Claire Harrell. I did my first degree at the University of Oxford, which is the only place where you can do a, a degree, um, any place in the UK you can do a degree in just medieval literature. I then did an interdisciplinary medieval masters at York, which combined literature, history, archaeology, everything like that. And then a PhD at the University of Birmingham, where I was a lecturer for a couple of years before I started working for a charity called The Brilliant Club, who you might have seen around and about at Seren today. Um, in this masterclass on the humanities, we're going to be answering this question, why didn't medieval women take selfies, which maybe you guys already have some ideas about, but we'll be coming back to it um, in a minute. But that's not all we're going to be doing today. We're going to be thinking about um, what skills are common across the humanities and why we might want to study them. So what we're going to do today is examine some key questions asked within the humanities, especially history and literature, because that's what I know the most about, but they'll go across all the disciplines. We're going to study one example of academic research within my discipline, so medieval literature. By the end of today, you'll all be medievalists, whether you want to be or not. You'll have learned a lot about it. Um, we will determine why medieval women didn't take selfies, which is a bigger question than we might imagine. And think about what ideas and strategies you've learned today in this session with me that you might want to take on into your future studies. So, why the humanities? Uh, why would we study them? If you go on to university and you share your accommodation with people studying medicine or studying something that they think is going to earn them a lot of money and they hear that you're doing a history or a literature degree, they might ask you uh, why. So why are the humanities important to us? Well, um, does anyone recognise this chap? No, it's in Indiana Jones is a kind of fictional archaeologist um, and I've chosen this famous picture of him uh, punching a Nazi because if you, if you read the news now there's a lot of kind of far right stuff um, where people are talking about the past was a better time um, where there was, a, you know, different racial groups were pure and we know that's not true. From archaeology and ancient history we know that's not true. Um, so you need to understand the past if you want to stop people misusing it in the present. Um, English literature, so people recognise this chap? sort of more nods, but they're kind of not just about discovering things in books, but the things that you can learn from a close attention to literature. Um, creative things like drama and theatre studies, your opportunity to get your story told, um, or something more vocational like law. These aren't the only humanities, but this is what you might be thinking about if you're thinking about studying the humanities. Um, so today you're going to be thinking like medievalists, um, I'm going to ask you to think about what we might learn from the past. Um, so when we're studying the medieval past, we might be thinking about what the stories people told tell us about their attitudes and how those attitudes change after changed over time, or maybe how they didn't and some of those attitudes survive now. Um, we can learn about the social structures of the past from the stories that were told. Um, and again, are they similar? Are they different to now? Um, we can learn about the lives of people from the books that they owned, but also um, the books that they read and the books that were written and how these things circulated around, who was in charge of who was telling the story. Um, and particularly in this talk, we're going to think about how medieval attitudes towards gender and power um, were formed in the Middle Ages, how they changed and how they might persist today and how power was constructed and performed. So how do you persuade somebody that you're really powerful and that you're someone they should listen to? Uh, so why didn't medieval women take selfies? Any ideas? Yeah, it's a simple, simple answer to what you might think is perhaps a silly question. Why didn't medieval women take selfies? They didn't even have electricity. There was no concept of a camera. There were no phones. Um, so why have I asked you this question? Well, it leads us on to thinking about why might they have wanted to? Um, and why do we take selfies? And what do we do with them? So how many people in this room have ever taken a selfie? Yeah, okay, good. A lot of people owning up to it. I take a lot of selfies with my cat, which you may be pleased to learn you might see later on. Um, why do we take selfies? 
anybody feel brave enough to volunteer why they take selfies? Maybe someone from the back row. If you take selfies, why do you take them? Did you have your hands up? Do you guys take selfies? Did you say yeah? Why do you take them? Okay, good. So are you kind of remembering a good time with your friends? Yeah. So we might take them to remember a moment. Does anybody take a picture of themselves when they think they look kind of nice? Yeah, yeah, you think, actually, I look better than usual today. I'm going to take a photo. And what do you do with your selfies after? How many people share their selfies on a social media site or an app? Not, not, some people just take selfies for their own personal enjoyment. Some people share them around. Uh, but there are a way that you can completely control how you appear. You're holding the camera. You're holding the phone. You can see what the picture's going to look like. So they're a, a powerful tool that's available to us now. Um, when we think about um, how we want to control how we look and how we want to share it. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share some pictures I've taken of myself. Some of them are proper selfies, some of them are just pictures of me. Um, I'm going to ask you to be very kind about them uh, and because my self-esteem is very fragile. But I'm going to show you two sets of selfies. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions about them. But these, the first set of selfies, are the ones from my professional social media profile. So um, this is a little bit old, but this was from me at my, my old job when I was a lecturer with a little article. Me with my supervisor, with my thesis. You can't see that one very well. I'm standing outside an Oxford college, ready to do some work. This is me at an event like this, talking at um, a kind of public history event, handing in my thesis, looking very smug, graduating from my PhD with one of my friends teaching Beowulf to some cute little kids uh, and giving this exact talk at my old Oxford College. So 30 seconds with the person next to you. What do you think I want people to think about me when they see these selfies? Okay, great. Anyone feel brave enough to tell me what they think about me in these selfies? Uh, maybe someone from the middle, what did you guys say? Yeah, exactly. All I'm talking about, isn't it, is my work. I'm either talking about something that I've written or I'm showing myself teaching. So very uh, career focused, very focused on the academic side of my life. What else do people say? I'm promoting myself and my achievements, aren't I? Talking about all these work things that I've done. Um, how am I generally dressed in the selfies? Put your hands up, think relatively smart? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, a bit smarter than today. Um, no Seren t-shirt in sight. So I'm, I'm kind of looking sort of smart and professional. Um, who am I usually with? I'm on my own quite a lot, aren't I? On my own with the things that I've achieved. Maybe I'm with colleagues and my supervisor um, and someone else who I did my PhD with. But generally, uh, smart and career focused and talking about what I've achieved. Would you like to see the selfies from my personal social media? So, yes, enthusiastic nod at the back. Thank you, young lady. Um, so these are the ones from my personal social media. This is me after a little run, doing a half marathon with one of my friends at a party with some friends, at a friend's wedding, more pictures with some friends, at being irresponsible with some historical costumes with my mum, and it's my personal specialty, the selfies with my cat. He loves taking photographs with me. So uh, again, 30 seconds with the person next to you. Um, how am I presenting myself here? What do I want people to think about me? <laughs> OK, 
Okay, great. So I, sh I do this lecture relatively frequently. I do a simplified version with kind of 14-year-olds. And the last time I put this up, they said, you look like you don't care what anyone thinks about you, which I don't know if that was a compliment or not. I chose to take it as one. Uh, but hands up if you think I look printed myself in a similar way for the first set of selfies here. And hands up for different. So how do I want people to think about me when I share these selfies? What did, do people say? Yeah. They're good. A lot of them with big groups of people, aren't they? How else am I making myself seem fun? Are smiling, yeah, good. So kind of different facial expressions, even from the first set of pictures, and different kind. How are the poses different? Would you say? Good, much more formal stance than the other ones, and these ones may be a bit more playful. How else do I want people to think about me um, in these photos? Yeah, good, absolutely. Very different emphasis, right, from the first set, which were very, you know, these are the things that I do for my work, these are the things that I've achieved. But when I'm sharing things um, on my personal social media, I'm talking about time I spend with friends and time I spend with family. Um, a lot less serious. What about what I'm wearing in a lot of these? How is that different? Do I generally look smart in these? Hands up if you think I look smart. Hands up if you think I look casual. Yeah, I mean, this one, I'm in my pyjamas, so I wouldn't wear that into work. So a lot more different. And um, hands up if you think I look more powerful in the first set of selfies. Yeah, pretty much everyone, so I won't ask you the half. Put your hands up if you think my cat looks nice. Yes. Not everyone, though. Some dog people are in the room. Um, and he's very, very beautiful. So selfies are a really good way of controlling or a way of curating your public image and thinking about what you share. So I wouldn't share these um, in a professional setting except from here with you. Um, but people are very negative about selfies, and particularly about young women taking selfies. They talk about young women take a lot of selfies. They're very vain. They want people to think that they're really beautiful all the time. And it's a, a symptom of our generation and your generation's obsession with themselves. You know, are you addicted to selfies? People talk about it like a disease. You won't get a job if you take too many selfies. Um, so self-itis talking about it um, like a disease and an obsession. And I'm not sure I really um, buy this. And it seems like a kind of snobby way of understanding the fact that particularly young people now and young women have this opportunity to control how they appear in public and to share that and to curate a public image of themselves online. And why shouldn't we want to have a bit of control over how we appear? Why shouldn't we want to take a nice photograph of ourselves that either represents us as you know, professional, competent, achieving things, or fun and kind of social and family orientated? Um, so, people recognise this family? Sort of nodding, famous for taking a lot of selfies. I know this is quite an old photo, they have like about a billion more babies now. Um, but this is an old family Christmas card of them, um, which they take and they send out to their friends. And, and they're a kind of a family, a female dominated family who take a lot of selfies. So, what I'd like you to do now with the person next to you, take two minutes Thinking about this image, how do the Kardashian family make themselves appear powerful in this image? And see if you can come up with three ways that they appear powerful.
Who put your hands up if you've already got three ways they appear powerful? Hands up if you want um, 30 more seconds. Okay, people kind of know what they think. So how are the Kardashians making themselves appear powerful in this image? Yeah, absolutely. They're dressed smartly in dark colours, so very dramatic. Who is wearing a different colour? Yeah. Uh, the matriarch in the middle. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly the word I would have used of her. The momager, the matriarch. Chris Jenner right in the middle and uh, not just different colour clothes, but this kind of sparkly sequin dress and she's dominating the space. So they're all kind of close together and she's separate. She's absolutely putting herself um, in the position of power. And um, what else about their clothes? Does anyone in this room wear clothes like this or own clothes like this? Yeah, good. So why do we associate suits with power, do you think? Absolutely. So we have this kind of androgynous dressing and the suit and we associate suits with business, don't we? And with power and with money. Even the baby is in a tiny suit. Like, even the baby is really smartly dressed. Um, what about their clothes? Why don't we, all of us here, own clothes like this? Pretty expensive, right? Expensive designer clothes. So they're showing off their wealth, they're performing their wealth and they're performing their power because wealth and power go hand in hand. How else are they making themselves appear powerful? Absolutely, so they're standing really powerfully, they look really strong. And what about their facial expressions and the way that they're looking? Yeah, this is their family Christmas card and they're all got faces on like this, doing their serious fashion faces. And there's nothing kind of welcoming us in to join them. It's not a friendly or approachable picture. It's a picture that shows them as really powerful um, and untouchable. And did I hear you guys talking about the background over here in this corner? What did you say about the background? So what are they standing in front of? Because they're not standing in front of like a Christmas tree, are they? Or a little uh, sleigh? We didn't really know. We just sort of said there was kind of grey walls, grey heavy seats and kind of things. What kind of buildings have pillars and are made of that kind of, of heavy stone? Yeah, religious places, and did you say palace? Did. Yeah, yeah, so it's a kind of palace, like the place that we associate with power and with long-standing institutional power, like the church, or like a palace, or like a museum. And there, so the Kardashians are standing in front of this really old building, and we've only really been aware of the Kardashians for kind of, you know, maybe seven years, maybe 10, an absolute push in the States. But standing in front of the old building is giving us the impression that they're an old established family, that they've been around for a really long time. They've got the longevity of something like a palace. Um, you know, it's not their house. I don't think even them have a house that fancy, but it's that construction of power, that suggestion that this is a space in which they're comfortable. And going hand in hand with that, we have all the generations of the family here. So we've got the grandparents, we've got the daughters and their husbands and the son in there somewhere, and we've got the uh, ludicrously smartly dressed baby to remind us that Kris Jenner is the head of this, this dynasty that's going to go on and this long established wealth is going to pass from generation to generation. And does anyone have anything else to say about how they, uh, they appeared powerful before we move on? Absolutely fantastic, this family unity. Um, and they're obviously not that harmonious a lot of the time, but that kind of fiction that they're one family unit and they're all together is very important to them. Um, so when we think about power and we think about women publicly um, asserting or promoting their power, now we might think about women like this, 
We might think about uh, political women. I think Theresa's probably slipped a little bit down since I took this screenshot. Um, but when we, maybe we see some of the same things, like the androgynous clothing, the wearing of suits as a symbol of power. And the same, um, these uh, two are both tech CEOs. That, that these women look very different from the Kardashians, maybe, but are also tapping into some of the same ways of performing power with the suits and with the expensive clothes. But um, what they don't do is share images of their families and have that emphasis on family or dynasty. Um, and in the Middle Ages, the performance of power was very different. Um, women wanted to appear like the Virgin Mary. So that kind of imagery of motherhood, maybe of fertility, um, but also of, of peacefulness and dignity. Um, and this is a medieval image of the Virgin Mary looking very serene that we'll, we'll come back to and um, a kind of medieval queen that we're going to come back to today. So I want you to think about the different ways that power is constructed and performed. How can a woman make herself feel powerful? This was the question that I set out to answer with my thesis, which was about um, women commissioning books basically to promote themselves which is the closest thing they could get to a selfie. Um, but I thought a lot about what makes women appear powerful now. So why are the rules for political women different for the rules for women who are in the media? What might be similar? So again, kind of much more androgynous dressing, smarter suits. And what might be different for women whose power comes in different ways? This emphasis on family and on dynasty and also on physical attractiveness. So we're going to go on now to look at a medieval woman who would have taken a lot of selfies if she could. Emma of Normandy, if her name hasn't fooled you, she was from Normandy. She was French, Norman French. Um, this is, we're talking more than a thousand years ago. Um, she was born in the 980s and she died in 1052. Does anyone know what big political event happened in England just after 1052? Yeah, Norman Conquest, Battle of Hastings, and we're talking about before then, and, and people kind of had this idea that the Anglo-Saxons were in England pootling along and then the Normans came, but actually in between there was a period of big unrest where England was repeatedly invaded by Danish Vikings, and um, Emma was queen at that time. First she was queen of an, the Anglo-Saxon king, Ethelred the Unready, who was a, a pretty poor king, um, but then she married King Canute, who was a Viking who took over and who conquered in the brief period that England was under Danish rule. Uh, so she had a few PR problems. People didn't really like, medieval people didn't really like women who got married twice. Um, and medieval English people were not very keen on the Vikings because they kept invading them. But Emma, who was a foreign queen to start off with, married a Viking king. Um, and so she sorted out this problem by commissioning a book in praise of herself. If you like a kind of perfect selfie where she always looked right. At the front of this book is this image of Emma um, and receiving the book. And thinking about the kind of things that you thought about with the Kardashians, so the posture, the clothing, and the setting, I want you to take two minutes again with the person next to you to come up with three ways that Emma is trying to appear powerful in this image. Okay, hands up if you've already got three ways that Emma looks powerful. Some people, hands up if you think you need 30 more seconds. Okay. So how's Emma making herself appear powerful in this picture? Yeah, so good, lots of really good points in there. So like Chris Jenner in the family photo, she's dominating the space. She's above the men, all of the men in the picture. Um, so what relationship do you think um, these men have to Emma? So these are a good guess. Why would you say they were dukes? Is it because they've got the kind of fancy yeah. hats on? They're her sons. So they're princes. So her sons, who are kind of adult men and heirs to the throne, they don't get much space in the picture. They're just kind of little leany boys coming around the corner to see if they can help their mum out. And she's dominating the space. They're standing and she's sitting. Um, and you mentioned this figure here. Does anybody uh, know what kind of person this, this is at the front? Any guesses? Yeah, absolutely, he's a monk. So we've got the hair, the monk's tonsure. That's just a hole in the manuscript. He's not got a scary mouth. He's supposed to have a normal mouth. Um, and he's wearing a monk's robes. Um, and he, if you look, he's got his hands covered 
by his robe. And we usually don't see that in the Middle Ages unless someone's touching um, the Gospels, the Bible, or like a divine object. So it's kind of suggesting that um, Emma's book here that he's presenting to her is a sacred object or that Emma herself is sacred. It's a very powerful um, image, especially because in medieval society, as you say, women are kind of uh, not got the same status as men. They're seen as, as inferior to men, kind of naturally, that there's no way to get around it. Um, and also in medieval society, you've got the church at the top. And sometimes the king gets lumped in with that because he's chosen by God. And then you've got the, the, the people who fight. So knights come a little bit later than this, but we're still thinking about the people who are on the battlefield fighting, and people who are nobles or above that. And then underneath that, you have all the people who are working on the land um, and tilling the field. So as a churchman, as a man of the church, he's supposed to be above everybody apart from the king. But here he's kneeling in front of Emma in a position of submission. So that's a very strong statement of power. Um, and then you mentioned her posture and where she was sitting. Did anyone else talk about what Emma looks like she's sitting on? Any ideas? This thing here? Does it look like a, maybe like a little throne to anyone? She's sitting down, everyone else is standing. Um, how else is she making herself appear powerful? Absolutely. So the clothing, like the Kardashians, rich performative clothing. So she's got this crown on um, or a very fancy hat. And her sons have got crowns on, but hers has got these feathers on. It's much more elaborate. Um, and what particularly about her clothing suggests to you that it's fancy? Absolutely. So these are kind of jewel encrusted bits or maybe embroidery. And also we've got lots and lots of folds in it. Fabric was very, very expensive in the Middle Ages. So if you had something that was drapey, that was fabric, then that was a sign of status. So we know she's very rich because she's got these elaborate clothes on and her sons are kind of in matching gear. So like the whole Kardashian family being dressed in really expensive designer clothes, Emma's whole family are dressed um, in luxury clothes. Anyone talk about the setting? What kind of setting does she look like she's in? You look very confused at the front. I think it's a kind of palace. I think we've got these columns as well. And we've got the expensive fabric draped around. So like the background of the Kardashian picture, we've got this elaborate uh, fabric. What don't we have in this picture? Who's missing? The king, yeah. Emma doesn't need a man to be powerful. The sons are subordinate to her. This man of the church is subordinate to her. Emma doesn't need a husband in the picture. She's a queen, but she doesn't need a king. And at the time when Emma became queen, that was a really new idea that a queen even existed. So before then, the king could have a wife who would have his children, but a queen, a woman with administrative power. So when we talk about administrative power, we mean dispensing money dispensing public money, and we mean um, having a say in laws or treaties and foreign affairs with other countries. So she doesn't need a king. She's in charge on her own. She's a consecrated queen. So she's a queen that's recognized in church. So there's lots and lots of ways that Emma is showing herself to be powerful here that we might want to think about. Um, this is part of Emma's book, which was written in Latin, which is a kind of another status symbol, a symbol of power. Emma's book says lots and lots of different things about her, but this portion describes how she came to marry her second husband, King Canute. I'm going to give you 30 seconds of, of quiet reading time to read through the passage, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Hands up if you need a little bit more reading time. Okay, 
hands up if you finished. Okay, most people. So what I want you to do now with the person next to you, two minutes, identify two ways that Emma makes herself appear powerful in this text. Hey, hands up if you've already got two ways that Emma looks powerful. Yeah, most people. Okay, so how's Emma making herself appear powerful in this text? Yeah. She, she said she was thinking that um, she would not marry him if he had um, a big woman. So it shows that she has like, just like an attitude of like dominance over the woman. And then in that time, it won't be seen as the norm. Yeah, fantastic. So right here at the end, so Emma refuses to marry Canute unless he would promise her that he would never set up the son of any wife other than herself to rule after him. So he's not promising he won't have any other children and, and Canute already has a wife. So we think about the Middle Ages as a very Christian time. In the early Middle Ages, we have a lot of old Germanic practices hanging over, including if you were king, you could basically have as many wives as you could pay for, but you'd only have one who you married in church. So he was married to Emma in church. She was recognized in church as his queen, but he had another wife who confusingly has the exact same name um, with whom he has other sons. But Emma makes him promise that it will be her sons who will take precedence and her son does inherit Denmark from Canute. So she does, we know that she gets what she wants. Um, and what kind of condition is she setting on the marriage then? How would you describe that condition? Yeah, so in her version of events, and the way Emma tells the story is that women do have a say, particularly royal women. Emma's got a lot of political clout behind her. She's well connected and she sets a political condition on the marriage. How does Canute try to persuade Emma to marry him? Yeah, absolutely. So he tries to bribe her with royal gifts. And do you know what a wooer is? A person who tries to woo. Perfect definition. So someone who tries to do your chatting up on your behalf. So Canute sends his mates round, right, with loads of expensive presents and says, Canute really likes you. Will you please marry him? And Emma's not interested in that. She's not interested in presents and bribery. She's not interested in flattery. She needs a political promise from Canute that her dynasty will be protected, that her sons will rule. So we're seeing a woman who's, she's not shallow. She's not swayed by gifts, according to her own version of events. And she's politically savvy. Um, what qualities in Emma make Canute want to marry her? Yeah, absolutely. So she's rich and she's really noble. And uh, what other qualities does she have? 
Yeah, yeah, so she's beautiful, which is kind of what we expect, isn't it, when we're thinking about medieval queens getting flattered. But she's also wise, this, the importance on female intelligence and then the importance of a queen as someone who acts in partnership with a king. So Canute looks for someone to make the partner of his rule. Did this surprise anyone about a medieval king? Some nodding. So we think about, um, when we think about the Middle Ages, we have this, or um, this kind of the public idea of it is very two-dimensional. You know, women are really downtrodden. But um, a queen had an important role to play and could, if she was well-educated and if she was married to a good king, she could be in partnership with him. Canute and Emma did work in partnership. So under her first husband, Ethelred the Unready, we don't have any documents with Emma's name on, hardly. She's kind of, we know they got married, we know she had children with him, but we don't really know anything else. As soon as she marries Canute, she's signing things into law, she's dispensing of vast amounts of money, she's acting as his political advisor, and she's commissioning this text that shows her in a really good light. So we know that Emma was, to an extent, Canute's partner. So don't forget that Canute was an invading king coming in who didn't know anything about England, but Emma had already been queen for a long time. So he relied on her to give information to him. And Emma's story constructs her as an essential part of his rule. So she's the matriarch of the dynasty, but she's also wise. She's an advisor. And what does it say about Emma's family in this passage? What kind of people does she come from? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is kind of a little bit shady because remember what I said just happened to the English? Yeah, and not just, so we think about the Viking raiding and Viking ransacking, but the Danish Vikings have completely taken over. They've got complete control of England. So um, Emma's not a loser English like her first husband. She's a victorious Norman. She's going to be really good and powerful for the dynasty. So we have that as well. Everything about this is constructed to kind of show how powerful um, Emma is. There's another version of events written before this. So Emma wrote this a long time after had this written a long time after she got married and after she and Canute had children, so all these things that she said are proved to be true. Um, but this is from the English version of events, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was a history that was written year on year. Can you all read this? No, this is old English. So this was written a long time ago, but don't worry, I have translated it for you. Um, so I'll give you 20 seconds to have a read of that and then I want to know how Emma appears in this version of events. Okay, so hands up if you think Emma appears powerful in this version of events. No hands? That's good. Would you have known this was about Emma if I hadn't told you? Why not? Yeah, absolutely. We don't even have her name. Whose name is mentioned? Yeah, we've got her father's name, so she's Richard's daughter. How else is she described? Yeah, so she's a daughter and she's something else. Yeah, the wife of the previous king. So we've got a woman here who's completely defined in relation to the men in her life. Um, so she's the wife of the previous king. She's Richard's daughter. This is all she gets. So this is like a short part of Emma's book. Her own version of events is really long. But this is all she gets in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is one sentence. What does it say Canute does in order to marry her? Fetches her. Put your hands up if you'd like to be fetched in this room. Not very nice, right? So in this version, Canute loves her because she's really noble and she's beautiful and she's wise. Uh, in this one, he throws her over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes and brings her back from Europe in order to marry her. So she's, um, in this version of events, she's just a political pawn who's moved around. Um, and which is why uh, maybe it's so important to Emma to tell her own version of events where she appears as really powerful. So that's Emma being powerful. Um, and this is some images of powerful women now. And so what I want you to do with the person next to you, 30 seconds, two ways that they're similar in the ways that they're appearing powerful and one way that they're different. <laughs>
Okay, so one way that they're similar. Yeah, absolutely. In all of these, we've got luxury clothing. So maybe this isn't very ornate, but you can still see that it's really expensive and it's designer. So good. They're showing off through their expensive clothing. Any other ways that they're similar? Yes. Yeah, good, absolutely. So Beyonce looks like she's wearing a crown. She also kind of looks like the Virgin Mary to me in this picture with the halo and the very heavily pregnant, which is a, like a lot of medieval images of the Virgin Mary. Um, and how? one more way that they're similar. What have we got in all three of the photos? Yeah, good. So these women are independently powerful without men. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I was thinking about the dynasty and the kind of family element. They're all suggesting to us that they're going to pass things on. If you listen to a lot of the more recent stuff that Beyonce and Jay-Z put out together, a lot of that is about dynasty and family. Kris Jenner's always there with her daughters. And we've got Emma with her sons. Uh, how are they different? Put your hand up if you think that we're supposed to think that Emma is sexy in this picture. No, but then we are meant to think, aren't we, that Beyonce and the Kardashians are attractive. They're presenting themselves as traditionally attractive. With Emma, we can't see anything about her body. We don't have that promotion of an attractive female form. But um, something has shifted in the way that we think about and construct female power. Partly it's to do with the fact that in the Middle Ages, there's no such thing as contraception or paternity tests. So if you have a queen that everyone's attracted to, that's a slightly dangerous position to be in. And women aren't promoting themselves as um, sexually attractive in the same way that now that's become another way of constructing yourself as powerful that we have Beyonce and the Kardashians spending a lot of effort on. So we've thought about Emma, and we're going to look briefly at one more medieval lady. This is Matilda of Scotland. She's one of my uh, all-time favourite historical people. Um, she was supposed to be a nun, um, but she ran away to marry Henry I, who was the son of William the Conqueror. He famously had over 50 illegitimate children, and I don't think he helped with any of the nappy changing. And he died from eating a surfeit of lampreys, so too many lampreys. It's like dying of like a caviar overdose or something like that. They were the most expensive luxury food. So he ate himself to death, and he was a bit of a, bit of a lad knocking everyone up. Um, but he was also a quite a kind of reckless king. He was always falling out with the Pope. And we have all these letters from Matilda where she has to write like, Dear Pope, Henry's very sorry for what he did. Please don't excommunicate us, etc., etc. So she was always firefighting for him. And he was also, he was the king of Normandy and the king of England. So often he would be away in Normandy and Matilda would be left to run the administrative affairs of England. Um, so, but she ran away. She was a nun and she ran away. We think, we're not sure. She says she wasn't. Um, and she, to marry Henry I. And she was hauled in front of the church courts, the most educated, privileged men of the medieval church, and she defended her right to marry in front of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and she did it successfully. She persuaded him um, that they should have got married. She was a prolific patron of the art, so the queen could, if she had a king who would allow her, which Matilda did, um, dispense of a lot of money. Matilda was supposed to spend that money on the church, but instead she spent it all on musicians, artists, and books, and books that described her as a saint. So um, that we remember her as, uh, or in her own kind of medieval PR campaign, she's promoted as someone who was very good for the church. But we have letters from churchmen saying, please stop stealing money from the church and spending it on musicians. Um, so she did what she wanted. Um, and she was the first woman who we know who acted as a justitia of the royal court. So she took on a legal administrative role independently of her husband. And she basically did whatever she wanted. And she got away with a lot of it because she commissioned lots of books about herself. One of the books that she commissioned wasn't directly about her. It was about her mother, um, St. Margaret of Scotland. And it was the saint's life. So a story that presented her mother as a saint. And St. Margaret was pretty well behaved. She did all the kind of things that medieval queens were supposed to do. She prayed all day and she had eight children, six of whom were sons and four of whom went on to be King of Scots after her husband. She was an English princess who was married to a King of Scots. Um, and she was famously a book lover and like a very, very holy person. 
So Matilda is kind of riding on the coattails of her mother's good reputation. And she writes the story. Um, she, she pays a monk like Emma, pays a monk to write her version of events. Matilda pays a monk to write a version of events about her mother. Um, and this is what she says about her mother's marriage. So 30 seconds, why do you think Matilda wants to say this about her mother's marriage? Okay, so what does she say about the circumstances of her parents' marriage? Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. So she says, my mother didn't want to get married. She got married because it was the will of God. Why do you think Matilda might want to say that? Does it make it sound like her mother wanted to marry her father? Is that like a kind of odd thing to say about your parents? I think we'd all be pretty uncomfortable with the idea that our parents didn't want to get married. But she says that my mother married uh, my father, who was very, very powerful, according to the will of God. Do you remember what I said about Matilda's marriage? So she's saying she's getting in trouble for abandoning a religious life. And then she says, this is my mother. She's such a saint. What God really wants is for saintly women like my mother to marry rich and powerful men. That's God's top number one priority, is that royal women should marry rich and powerful men. So it's reflecting on her own choices, suggesting, making us think maybe this is what God wanted for her. Um, she says lots of positive things about her mother. But one of the things that she talks about is um, the way that her mother... Um, reformed the Scottish church. So the Scottish church used to be different from the Roman church. When Margaret came to Scotland, she reformed it. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds reading time with this little passage, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, so one minute with the person next to you. How does Matilda describe her mother here? And why do you think she wants to describe her in this way? Okay, so first of all, how does Matilda describe her mother here? Yeah. Yeah, like explicitly more intelligent than men. So we've got the men who are the most educated men in the Scottish church, um, but she's deeper intelligence, she's smarter. We've got a royal woman who's smarter than church men. Um, and she's not just more intelligent, what else is she better at? Yeah, 
yeah, yes, yeah, so we've got a woman who's not only, like, her study isn't a private thing. She doesn't go off and study religious books and just be clever by herself. She shares it. She's persuasive. Why do we think Matilda wants to show her perfect mother as being more intelligent than churchmen and being really persuasive? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe it reminds us of Matilda defending herself in front of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And also by having her perfect mother do it, her mother who's considered a saint, it's like, this is what a good woman can do. As long as it's, um, you know, she's, it's because of the study of the Bible, actually it's really good for women who, by the way, can sometimes be a lot more clever than men, even the most educated men in the Scottish church. Um, and it's right that women give advice, that women are intellectual beings who understand things and who persuade men of what the right thing is to do. And these things then do happen. And we know that Matilda had a very powerful advisory role with Henry I because of the letters and him always getting into fights with people. Um, but Matilda gets away with this here with saying, you know, my mother was so much more intelligent than the men because the life of St. Margaret is actually quite xenophobic. It's like Scotland was really savage and my English mother came in and fixed it. But it still makes us think about Matilda's own life and it would circulating around in Matilda's time, reminding people that with the right protection from God, powerful women had the authority to do this kind of thing. Women could be wise and learned and could make real changes, just like Matilda um, herself did. So why do I care about this? Why do I care so much about texts that women paid other people to write? Well, because we still read them now and they give us a picture of powerful, influential women. Um, they couldn't take selfies. They couldn't have a kind of short-term, instant way of promoting themselves in a particular way. Um, but even now, that's kind of temporary. And the only way to be part of the real conversation is to have that level of education. So Emma and Matilda, they were very rich. They were very noble. But above everything else, they both had the best educations it was possible to get in the Middle Ages. They were educated in abbeys. They read, they may have understood Latin. Matilda definitely understood Latin. Emma might have done multiple languages, trained from a young age in statecraft and politics. Um, and the women who we have now who wrote in the Middle Ages, they survive and so much is lost. But that search for education is still ongoing now, which is why I always uh, put my girl Malala on the slide. Um, because it's such a powerful tool, that education, that being part of the real conversation. Um, so why do I think you should care about the Middle Ages? So this is my particular area of interest, how women construct and perform power, because I care about how it changes over time. What do we think about when we think about a powerful woman? How do women um, gain access to power that we think they might maybe shouldn't have had in the Middle Ages, according to ideas about men and women? Um, and then what do we think about women now? Why now do we kind of have this, um, this choice, if you like, as powerful women? Women are either kind of smart, maybe slightly androgynous politicians, or we have women who are very influential but maybe aren't seen as intellectual. Um, and although there was a lot more of a limit on women in the Middle Ages, we have queens where there's an emphasis on intelligence and family. Um, and there's lots of reasons to care about the Middle Ages. Um, and also now it's very politically pressing. So this is Islamic State produces like a glossy magazine every month. And it's full of medieval imagery from the kind of medieval Persian Empire. So these, the way that these guys are dressed here is the kind of uh, medieval Islamic version of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And you might see lots of stuff that's really popular at the moment in England as well. And it pops up whenever we're at a time of national anxiety. Um, do people follow the Charlottesville riots on the news? Very nasty, unpleasant riots. And there was a lot of medieval imagery. So this is a Viking symbol. The Ku Klux Klan refers to themselves as knights, making us think about the medieval world. And um, there were symbols of things like the Knights Templar. And it's people misusing medieval imagery to try and make us think that the past was a kind of racially um, subdivided place. And we know from history, from archaeology, from literature that that's not true. So if you understand the Middle Ages, if you understand the limits on power and how they came about and why maybe we still have some of the ideas about the limits that should be on women or how things are misused, so people wanting us to believe that the past was different from how it was, um, then we can be part of that conversation. So what do I think you learned today? What hopefully did you learn today that will help you with your A-levels? 
We've been critically evaluating images and hopefully you can take those skills on um, with you every day. So when you're looking at an image, thinking about what does this person want me to think? How is power constructed and promoted in this image? Um, and drawing comparisons between present and past ideas of, of um, power and success. So how are they similar? How have they changed? We've thought about how women in the public eye work to make up themselves appear powerful and how it might be different for men and for across time. So what does power look like? What does status look like? What could women do then? What limits are on them now? And these are maybe some of the subjects that you might think about those with. And we've also compared constructions of power across time. And you guys have used close textual analysis and close analysis of an image um, to form arguments about power and perspective. And you can see the kind of imagery of women and how it's changed. So using all the skills, the analysis skills, comparison skills, critical thinking and evaluating. So I hope you feel like you got all of that from it. Thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, you come up and ask me at the end. Thank you.